For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, So that those who believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Thus is the word of the living God. Let us pray. Father, now as we've come once again to worship you in the proclamation of your word in prayer and in song, we pray this morning that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, that you would convict those who need conviction, and that you would provide grace to your people this morning. We ask these things only because your Son has achieved our salvation, only because He has stepped in our place. We ask that you, Lord Jesus, dwell especially among us this morning as we've gathered in your name And we pray, precious Spirit of truth, that you'd come among us this morning. Give us focus and help us to dig into your word. We give you great thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to ask you for an early Christmas present. Uh, It's a favor, really. I just want you to ponder a question this Christmas season. I'd like you to think of it when you wake up and when you talk to your loved ones and when you go to work or school and when you lie your head on the pillow. I want you to ask yourself, am I a true Christian? Has the Christmas event and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in flesh Has that overthrown everything I believe and even my very identity? Because my great fear is that you and I will come here week after week and we'll participate in all of the rituals and symbolism and celebration of Christmas and at the end of it all we won't know Him. And I know there will be people like that who will have the culture of Christianity, they'll speak the Christianese, they'll do all the Christian things, and at the end of it all, they don't know Christ. Jesus promised that. He said, on that day many will come to me. They will say, Lord, Lord, we did this in your name, and we did that in your name. We served in your name. We were sacrificial in your name. And he'll say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. Not I did know you and you fell away. I never knew you. And so there's a class of people who are doing all of the Christian things, engaging in all of the uh, Christian activities, and yet they don't have the substance. They just have a veneer of religion over their life. If Christ and His coming, God invading His creation has not overthrown who you are and informed the way you see the world, if it hasn't totally transformed how you understand this life, make this the season that it does. Don't allow yourself to go through the motions. What Paul is going to remind us in this passage of is who we are outside of Christ, our natural state, And then he's going to show us what has been achieved in the coming of Christ on Christmas Day, and then additionally what he has achieved in his cross and resurrection. And I hope when you leave this place this morning, you will listen to these words in your heart, treasuring them and pondering them. And so let's begin. Verse 3, For we ourselves were once foolish, 
disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. We ourselves were once foolish. Humanity is the one creature on God's green earth that is at once unbelievably genius and completely foolish. There are people who study the celestial bodies, who devote their lives to the study of space and the galaxies and the planets, and they see the, the glorious creation and the design inherent therein. They, they see how the planets hang in their place and how this planet is uniquely situated for human life and discovery. And they look at all of that. And despite all of their skill, they say, there is no God. Or there are people who study life on the cellular level and they uh, look at all of the wonderful design inherent in, in cells. They look at the information that has been placed there in DNA. And they marvel at it and say, there is no God. And the truth is that we all know that there's a God, but we must, in our sin, actively suppress that knowledge because we resist the idea that there will come a day when the books of our life are opened and God will call us to account. We are, in our natural way, fools because we don't start with the fear of God. The Bible tells us that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. And so if we attempt to live our lives outside of the purview of God's lordship, what happens is that we in inevitably become fools. You think about it. The God who put the breath in your lungs and the clothes on your back and the food in your stomach, and you try to live outside of what he commands. You take the life that he's granted to you by mercy in his common grace, And you live it not according to his dictates, but to yours. We ourselves were disobedient. There is just something in the human constitution that requires us to be rebels. We're all like that. You know, not one of us has had to teach our children to rebel. They just come out of the womb that way. And instead, you have to teach them to be obedient, don't you? You have to discipline them and try to train them up to be Uh, conscientious and thoughtful adults who are obedient to authority, but in our natural way, we're not obedient, we're disobedient. And what happens if you don't discipline your kids and, and try to train them up that way? They become little monsters, and before long they become big monsters because it is our natural way to go and be disobedient, to to go astray. And when we do that, we're fulfilling the mandate of our father, the devil. Jesus says if we're outside of His grace, God isn't our Father. Rather, we're doing our Father's work, the Father of lies. Disobedience is His native tongue, and it's ours as well. Paul says, we ourselves were led astray, that is, we've been misled. And he explains that in the next clause, slaves to various passions and pleasures... What has led us astray is our own corrupt desires, passions, and pleasures. And usually what we do is we couch these passions and pleasures in respectable ways, like religion. We couch them in respectable American lifestyles. And we think in the pursuit of our pleasures and desires that we are, in fact, embracing freedom, and what we're really embracing are the bonds of slavery. Because when we try to live outside of the will of God, try to do it on our own and act as though we're Lord, what we're grasping are chains, not freedom. And what do we do with that? What do we do do with the fact that that we know that our desires and pleasures won't satisfy. We know they won't, but we still rationalize in our hearts and say, well, they must. If I do it this way, I'll finally find satisfaction and joy. 
I remember I was talking to a young man once. He was going uh, in a bad way. I asked him, I said, you know, what's your goal? And basically he told me he desired to be rich and famous. And I said, really? You become rich and famous, then you'll be happy? He said, absolutely. I said, okay. How many times does a rich and famous person have to go into rehab like the 10th time or get a divorce for like the 5th time? Or to have some kind of tragedy on the cover of a tablet? How many times does that happen until we realize that the treasures of this world and all of the trappings of this life won't satisfy, won't provide us the joy that we desire, and instead... It's merely the means unto slavery. And see, what we do is we, we reflect on our lives. We realize that we're not completely right. We know that there is something wrong with us. There is some brokenness. And so what we do is we judge ourselves. We're not completely non-reflective. We think about our lives. We think about our character But here's the thing, we don't judge ourselves according to the basis of God's holy law, which is merely a reflection of His holy character. What we do is we look at our neighbor, usually at their worst moment, and we think to ourselves, we're not like them. I didn't do what she did. I didn't do that thing that he did the other day. Or what we do is we look at the next lower social class and we think, We've got our stuff together. You know, we look at the drunkard or the drug addict and think, they're slaves, I'm not a slave. I'm not doing that. And what we don't realize is that addiction and slavery are not restricted to physical substances. Addiction is not tied necessarily to drugs or alcohol. It could take innumerable forms. It could take the form of anger or arrogance or gossip. And fundamentally, what is the pursuit of those passions and desires? What is the, what is the big problem with it? It's idolatry. It's attempting to find joy apart from God when in fact the only thing in existence that will grant us joy is God. It is treasuring Christ. Paul says we were passing our days in malice and envy. Passing our days, meaning we've been given this life for however long we have it, and God was under no obligation to give us how much time we've had. He could have took us out right from the get-go. He was not under any requirement to keep us alive, but He does in His common grace. And let's say you get 10 or 80 years. You treasure that time. You view it as fleeting and precious. No, what we usually do is we bide our time and we spend it on malice. Uh, Malice comes from the Greek word kakia, which in turn comes from the word kakos, which means evil. Malice kakia is like intentional wickedness. Intentional depravity, usually it's directed at someone, whether, uh, you know, a human being or God himself. You look around, there's a lot of malice going on. The left hates the right, the right hates the left. The unbelieving world hates the church, and a lot of the church hates the unbelieving world. We bide our days in malice and envy. You know what envy is? Envy is when you look at your own situation and what has been given to you by the hand of God. And you become discontent. Envy is exactly the opposite of contentment or gratitude. It's, it's ingratitude. You look at that, your own plight, and you think it's inferior, and then you look at someone else and what they have, whether in property or in position, and you begin to lust after what they have, and because of your discontentment, you begin to wish ill will on the person who has what you don't have. We do that all the time, don't we? Constantly we do that. And there's nothing wrong with desiring things. 
There's nothing wrong with having a healthy desire to improve yourself or something like that. Let's say you're in a job, you want to move on to a different career. There's nothing wrong with that. But when it, it occupies the place in your heart that belongs to God and Him alone, that's when it's a problem. When we begin to look at people in their lives and think, they don't deserve that, but I do. When we look at someone and we think, well, they're not going through the trouble that I'm going through. They seem to have it all together. They're, they're doing just fine, but why do I have to suffer in this way? Or why do I have to deal with these afflictions, but they don't? And we begin to fixate on that person because they're the symbol of what we cannot have, and then we give our hearts over to envy. Envy is just like jealousy. It's just stronger. Paul says we... We're hated by others and hating one another. Now, the two words translated hated are not the same Greek word. Uh, hated by others, that is a term which refers to detesting someone, uh, to consider them an abomination, it's the strongest kind of hate. We're hated by others, and we in turn are hating one another. And hate in all of its forms... What is it really? It's merely murder of the heart. It is engaging in a kind of premeditated slaughter, but not carrying out the deed. It's murder of the heart. Jesus says when you hate your brother, you're breaking the commandment of murder because God doesn't merely look on your external life. He looks at all of you, including your intentions and your thoughts, And what we see in our life is constant hate. Somebody cuts you off, you get that feeling in your gut, that's what that is. Somebody mistreats you or your boss maligns you or treats you unfairly, and you think that you have a license because you were wronged to engage in hate. And hate really is... It's the, it's the feeling that results in reprehensibility towards someone else. And if no one was looking and no one would find out, you might just do the deed. And you might think, well, I've never been willing to do that. Think again. We've all been in a place of desperation where we had someone we didn't want anything to do with, where we would have done anything to get out of a situation. Maybe we were just too much of a coward to carry out the act, but we believed it, we felt it, and this is who we are. And if you don't think this is who you are, then you need to take a second look at reality because this is it. This is who you are in and of yourself. This is how you were born. Your identity is wrapped up in these commitments. And what it speaks to is absolute hopelessness and corruption. But when the goodness and kind, loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, notice the comparison. He is good. The Savior is good. We're not good. Even in your most altruistic moments, your best moments, your motivations were corrupt. They were impure. Sin touched everything you've done and everything you are. Idolatry ruled it, but not Christ. He's good and kind and merciful. He's merciful in the sense that He gives sight to blind people and welcomes the most detestable kinds of people into His arms, into His loving kindness. And He feeds hungry people and He's merciful to those grieving and he speaks words of healing and love to those who are afflicted and he blesses those who curse him 
and ultimately would give his life for those who crucified him. But when the goodness and loving kindness of our Savior appeared, he saved us. Why? Why did he save us? Because we were religious enough? Because we met him in the middle? Because we uh, came to a comfortable building a couple of hours every week? No, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Here's the point. You don't save anyone. You need the saving. And it is God who does the actions of the verbs. It is God who brings about the salvation. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. Not by your obedience to God's law. Not because you were kind when it was convenient. Not because you uh, weren't as bad as your neighbor. Because, listen, God is not judging people upon the basis of fallen notions of fairness or relative goodness. No. He saved us according to His mercy. Mercy like grace is undeserved kindness. This mercy brings about a comprehensive change in who we are, what we're capable of, and where we're going. Notice the phrase, the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior. What Paul is saying is that Jesus is no mere man. He is a man. He's an authentic human being, just like you and I, even right this moment. But he is not merely a man. Rather, he is both God and man. Think of the miracle of Christmas whereby the Creator God enters into all of the limitations of human existence, taking upon Himself that lowly state, going from the perfect majesty of heaven to a filthy stable. The infinite Creator God who invented language needed to learn how to speak. The God who fed the birds and the fish of the sea needed to be fed by his mother. When he appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness. You know why? Because we haven't done any works in righteousness. If you think that what you've done in this life merits for you peace with God, you either have a too low view of God or a too high view of yourself, or perhaps both. Because what the Bible says is that we are not to judge our righteousness according to our neighbor or according to our transient opinion, but rather we are to judge ourselves upon the basis of God's holy law. And when we look at that law in the face, what we see is that we've not done righteousness. Ask yourself the question, have you always kept God first in your life? You say you have, you're a liar. And while we're thinking about lies, how many lies precisely have you told? Or are you like me and you've lost count of the number? And how many of us have not obeyed our mother and father? How many of us have skipped church because we had better things to do? How many of us have been discontent with what God has provided and coveted things that didn't belong to us? How many of us have given ourselves over to impurity of thought? The reason why he hasn't saved us according to our works done in righteousness is because there aren't any works done in righteousness. Rather, the situation is that because of our unrighteousness, Christ, the Holy Son of God, the infinitely pure Son of God who never sinned, who never was maliceful, who was never envious, who was never a slave to passions, but instead who was always righteous and always kind and always obedient to his Father, that one became an object of wrath. The Father made his Son an object of wrath. His Son who was innocent and pure. That's the wonder of the cross. Because how could God crush His Holy Son? 
because his son willingly took upon himself the sins of the world so that those who might believe in him might receive eternal life, not because of works done in righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Christ by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. The means by which we gain access into this salvation where God grants us righteousness and grants us eternal life So that when He sees us, He no longer sees us with our sin, but rather He sees us in righteousness, the very righteousness of Christ, the means by which we gain access into that, is by the washing of regeneration. Regeneration, admittedly, it's not a term we use every day. What it refers to is a a heart transplant. You see, in our natural state, we have hearts of stone, idolatrous hearts, lustful hearts, angry hearts, hearts that are set up at war with God. And God pulls out that heart of stone and puts in a heart of flesh. God, the Holy Spirit, changes in a moment who we are. And as a result of that regenerative work, we respond in faith. Even the faith that you needed for your salvation. Because the Bible tells us clearly that we're saved by grace through faith in Christ, even the faith is a gift from God. That didn't come from you either. The entire salvific process is something that God is doing, something that He is achieving. And He did this when He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The Savior who was both God and man, who is both the infinite God and a humiliated servant was born 2,000 years ago walking our dusty roads and living on our corrupt earth dealing with all of the problems and maladies that are common among us and ask yourself why didn't God just send him as an adult so he could die on the cross be resurrected and go back why a baby? Why go through all the trouble of being born and having to learn how to talk and walk and and learning how to live as an adult? Why bother? Certainly God could have incarnated Christ as an adult. It is because for that 30 years, Christ was being completely obedient to the law of God doing all of the things that you and I should have done. And he was doing that not because he needed the righteousness. He was doing that because you need the righteousness. Christ's work from beginning in Bethlehem to the empty tomb was one big act of substitution for sinners. And here's the thing. In order to gain access into that wonderful gift of salvation... You must, in fact, humble yourself before God in repentance. This requires you to openly confess your sin to God, hiding nothing, being completely honest with yourself and with God about who you really are, and taking Him at His word when He says that those who have faith in My Son have eternal life. Paul writes, "...so that being justified by His grace..." we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That term justified, a word, a dikaiosune, it means to be declared righteous in God's sight. It is a legal declaration where God takes unrighteous, sinful people and positionally declares them to be righteous in His sight because they've been granted an alien righteousness. Not a righteousness of their own, but a righteousness from His Son. Luther called an act upon the cross the great exchange. He said, on the cross, the Son of God, who had never sinned, received your sin, took it upon himself, and became became the sacrificial lamb who would take your punishment away from you, who would receive the wrath of God upon himself, and in exchange, he grants those who would believe in him his righteousness. This is what justification is. It is remission of sins. 
that God no longer, as David says in Romans chapter 4, no longer counts our sin against us. It means also that our future sins are forgiven because when Christ died, all of our sins had yet to occur. Justification is comprehensive pardon and it is wrought in grace. Grace is unmerited by definition. Grace is undeserved kindness. And if you believe that you have in fact contributed in any way to this salvation, it is no longer grace. And that is what so many of us do. And we do it in different ways. We do it according to our attitude. If you convince yourself that you've sort of done well this week, you know, you didn't do the, maybe the conventional sins you're used to, but you, you fought hard and you honored God, and you come in this week and you're especially eager to praise God, that's self-righteousness. What you're doing is the equivalent of taking a fine silk suit and placing it on the corpse. Sooner or later, the rot is going to show through because the fact of the matter is our ground of worship was never, ever our righteousness. It was always the righteousness of Christ. We come before God with confidence, not because we've done our part, not because it's like you're saved by grace after all you can do, No, it's because the entire thing was grace. The entire thing was something that God was doing by grace. And what is the effect? That we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is important. When Jesus is born, what do the Magi say? Where is he who is king of the Jews? When Christ is exalted, what does God say? He is king of kings and lord of lords. And what the Bible tells us is that if you put your faith in Christ, you become inseparably united to Him, that His righteousness becomes your righteousness, and His atoning death becomes your death, and His uh, tomb becomes your tomb, and His resurrection your resurrection, and ultimately you will be resurrected. And so your identity, therefore, as a Christian is bound into Christ. There's not a hard and fast distinction between you and the Son of God anymore. And for that reason, you're all sons of God, if in fact you're in Christ. You ever read about what is to be given to Christ because of His achievements? All of the kingdoms on the earth? All of God's possessions? The very glory of God? Christ is to be comprehensively sovereign over it all and, in fact, will judge the world. And Paul says we are heirs according to the hope of eternal life. What he's saying is, inasmuch as you are in union with Christ in His righteousness, you are also in union with Christ in His glory. Which means there will come a day as a Christian when you will share the very glory of God. Athanasius, the great church father, said, Jesus became like us so that we might become like him. He entered in our time and space and took on our flesh so that we might take upon his glory. And so this Christmas season, as you see the symbols of Christ's love, and as you participate in the rituals of Christ's coming, don't get caught up in the commonality of it all and forget the fact that these things actually represent something very significant. And make your calling and election sure and analyze yourself and think about the fact, am I actually following Christ? A good way to evaluate that is to see if you've changed over time. Have you been loyal to Christ? Now, here's the, here's the tendency. Our tendency to, is to say that we've defeated sins X, Y, and Z, therefore we're saved. That's not what I'm talking about. That is self-righteousness. 
But if you can look and say, yes, God has changed me in these ways. I'm not putting my trust in those changes and those improvements in my life, but I see God working in my life, and I see my love for Christ growing, and I know that He is my only treasure. Well, then, you have a good metric by which to check yourself and make sure that you're in the faith. Look at your life and what you value, what you cherish. Does it accord with what is written here? Is Christ, in fact, your only hope? Can you be like Paul, who who would say that I've learned the secret of contentment, whether in poverty or in great plenty or in affliction or comfort? Why was Paul contented through all of those problems, through shipwreck and scourgings and beatings and stonings? It is because he had cut the tether between his heart and this earth, and he realized that the trappings of this world are not all there is. That this is just a fleeting glimpse, a foretaste of what is to come. And so look at your life this Christmas season. Are you walking through life with your hand and eyeball still firmly attached? Or have you, in fact, taken the knife out and done the hard work of pursuing holiness? Has following Christ cost you something? These are all good ways to, in fact, look at your life and to see the work of God in you. And so I pray this Christmas that you will think on these things and that each one of you will put your hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those here who maybe you've been coming to church for ages, you haven't really known Him, I won't make you walk the aisle or sign a card, but what you must do is to get alone on your face, cry out for God, to redeem and forgive you, and he will. Let us pray. And Father, we, we pray for our brothers and sisters who are not with us this morning, who are at home, and we pray that they are healthy and well. And we pray that your word would continue to stir our hearts, Help us to honor you in our lives and all that we say and do. Most of all, help us to put our trust in your Son. Give us strength to set aside our pride and to embrace Christ and Him alone. And we ask that you give us guidance this week And as we approach Christmas Day, we pray that we would be all the more grateful for the coming of our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.